It is said that good art enables us to find ourselves through it and lose ourselves because of it. If that quote rang true for you, it also rang true for me when I first experienced Blade Runner. Whether you're talking about the original film or the fantastic sequel, Blade Runner is one of those franchises that seems to age like fine wine. It had more influence on film and cinema than most know or give it credit for. Yet it was to my surprise that this franchise didn't have its own iceberg chart. I thought it would only be a matter of time. I waited and waited with no luck. So I said, fine, if nobody's gonna do it, I'll do it myself. I took it upon myself with the help of the Blade Runner Discord server and many long nights of research to create the first and only Blade Runner iceberg. This iceberg chart is about the entire franchise, but focuses more on the movies, lore, hidden knowledge, and unknown theories. With 8 tiers, each one being more obscure than the last, this video is different from what I usually do. It's longer and more laid back. So if you like this and you want me to make more, let me know in the comments down below. Also make sure to like, subscribe, and do all the extra stuff. Enough talk, let's dive straight into the surface waters with tier 1. Blade Runner The Final Cut is pretty much what is considered by many as the best version of the Blade Runner 1982 movie. It's the version you'll find on Blu-ray or streaming services, and there's also a 4K version that was released in 2017. If you ever want to watch Blade Runner, this is the version you would want to see. The sequel to the original and set 30 years after, Blade Runner 2049 was released in 2017. There isn't that many cuts to this movie, only the theatrical version and the open mat. I definitely recommend the open mat for obvious reasons. Harrison Ford plays the main character in the original Blade Runner film. Pretty self-explanatory, you can actually find interviews of him talking about this film dating all the way back to the 80s. Ryan Gosling plays the main character in the sequel. He had experience playing many characters who are either antisocial or loners, so he fit the role very well, one of his best performances. Black Lotus is a newly released animated series. It's not really liked much by the fans. It fails completely to capture the vibe, atmosphere, or anything really related to Blade Runner except for the name. Ridley Scott, the famous director who created the Alien movies, also directed the first Blade Runner. He's one of the most known and famous directors, and it's very likely you've seen some of his works. Denis Villeneuve is a very talented director who is known for directing the sequel, also for creating Arrival and the very recent movie Dune. Pretty much the biggest film composer alive, he composed the score for 2049, is also known for literally composing every movie ever. Deckard is the main character of the original Blade Runner film. Played by Harrison Ford, he is a hardened Blade Runner who is hunting down replicants. Officer KD6-3.7, played by Ryan Gosling, is the main character of the sequel. He is a Blade Runner who is also a replicant. So what is a Blade Runner? Blade Runner, also known as a Rep Detect, was a police unit organized to hunt down and kill fugitive replicants on Earth. This was referred to as retiring them instead of killing them. Yeah. 
Cyberpunk is a scientific subgenre characterized by countercultural anti heroes trapped in the humanized high tech future. Its main point is to show the combination of high tech and low life. Blade Runner Universe is peak cyberpunk and is one of the main reasons why the cyberpunk genre is so big today. And that's gonna be the end of tier 1. Three short films that were released before Blade Runner 2049 that recount three key events that happened before the film. That being Wallace Jr. introducing his new Nexus models, the 2022 blackout, and the introduction to Sapper Morton. All of these three entries will go deeper on later on the iceberg, but all short films are very good and a must watch. Originated from a single scene where a defeated Officer K looks at a giant ad of his virtual girlfriend that sparked a lot of memes, precisely Doomer style memes. I actually made a video about this a while back that you can check out for a deeper analysis. Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by author Philip K. Dick is the book that the original Blade Runner is based upon. It pretty much follows the same events as the film and it asks a simple question, what makes something human? Similar to the You Look Lonely memes but not as deep, these memes that you have probably seen circling in the internet of a pissed off Officer K screaming god damn it. The famous Greek electronic musician who composed the Blade Runner score, an absolutely beautiful body of work that is considered by many as a masterpiece. Vangelis is a living legend in the world of electronic music. The fact that both the old film and the new one use miniatures and real props instead of CGI. This makes the movies look better, be more grounded, and push them at a higher league compared to the CGI green screen movies that we have today. Cyberpunk 2077, one of the biggest games of 2020 and maybe even the biggest flops, you can find a hidden easter egg that refers to the Roy Batty Tears in Rain scene. Not only that, but when you get into this location, it triggers rain to start falling in the game. The Void Comp Test was a test used as of 2019 by the LAPD Blade Runners to assist in determining whether or not an individual was a replicant. The test measured bodily functions such as respiration, heart rate, blushing, and pupillary dilation in response to emotionally provocative questions. It typically took 20 to 30 cross-reference questions to detect a replicant. Similar to the Void Comp test, the Baseline test was an examination designed to measure any emotional deviancy by Nexus 9 replicants. To be off baseline would be considered a failure of such test. Constant K. You can pick up your bonus. Nexus is the name given to the replicant models with numbers to identify which line of replicants they belong to. 
introduced in 2000, the Tyrell Corporation's Nexus series of replicants were virtually identical to standard adult humans, but had superior strength, speed, agility, resilience, and intelligence to varying degrees depending on the model. The Tyrell Corporation is responsible for creating the first eight Nexus models, with Nexus 7 being the first to have implanted memories to help with more natural human emotional responses, and Nexus 8 having an open-ended lifespan. The Wallace Corporation is responsible for introducing Nexus 9s who are meant to be a lot more obedient. Joy was a brand of DG. A DG or digital companion was a fully customizable holographic companion designed by the Wallace Corporation. A known brand of DG was Joy. Released by the year of 2029, one of these Joy products is the love interest of Officer K in 2049. Iander Wallace Jr. was a scientist, replicant manufacturer, technologist, and CEO of the replicant manufacturing company Wallace Corporation. Wallace's first move onto the world stage occurred after the blackout brought the world into a state of crisis. With stock markets crashing and food shortages prevalent, he pioneered advancements into genetically modified food, essentially bringing an end to the global food crisis, ending his reluctiveness and allowing his company to expand on Earth and onto the off-world colonies. Roy Batty is the main villain of the original film. He was a Nexus 6 combat model replicant who rebelled, came to Earth to find a way to extend his limited 4-year lifespan. A group of Nexus 6 replicants illegally landed on Earth in a hijacked shuttle, seeking to extend their lifespans, four of these replicants being Leon Kowalski, Zora, Pris, and their leader Roy Batty, were all assigned to be retired by Blade Runner Rick Decker. This entry refers to the fact that the original movie had many different cuts, with some having minor differences like a different color correction, two entire scenes removed, or a voiceover added over the entire movie. A previously cut scene that was later added to the director's cut it's a source of much speculation and is the main reason why people believe Deckard might not be as he seems. The unicorn scene had people wondering for a while over whether it was just an artistic reference or if it had a deeper meaning. We'll go deeper on this theory and this scene later on the iceberg. The Blade Runner subreddit is a place where fans usually come together to discuss all kinds of topics, share news, memes, art, theories, and etc. It's a small and wholesome community. We're gonna start tier 3 with one of the most iconic scenes from the 1982 Blade Runner movie. The Tears in Rain scene is the climax of the entire film, where Roy Batty saves Deckard, shows his humanity only to accept his fate and die. All after giving easily one of the most iconic speeches in cinema. He recalls to Deckard the things he had seen on his off-world adventures as a combat replicant. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion, and sea beams glittering in the dark sky at Tannhauser's gate. All these moments, he says, will be lost in time like tears and rain. The beauty of this scene is that unlike Rachel and the other replicants' fake memories, Roy is recalling to Deckard his real memories, 
showing Deckard that even though he has lived a short life of four years, he had seen more things than Deckard ever could. Things, he said, you people wouldn't believe. I guess it is true that the candle that shines twice as bright burns half as long. Sea beams or cesium beams are believed to be weapons used in space combat. Reaching speeds near the speed of light, they are fired towards the enemy ship to disrupt and destroy its shields and hull. They glitter on impact. Roy was in space close combat and remembers those moments with longing. After all, he is a fighting machine. This entry refers to the fact that the last act of the original film is pretty much a horror movie. The whole scene, we see Roy hunting down Deckard like a predator hunting down prey. With shots like these and the entire soundscape of the scene, it makes you feel the sense of complete desperation and fear that Deckard must be feeling. This is about the upcoming Blade Runner and Alien live action series that is directed by Ridley Scott. This will be the first live action Blade Runner media that we have seen since 2049. A lot of fans are not happy with Black Lotus, so there's a lot of excitement from both the Blade Runner and the Alien communities. Due to forest fire smoke in the atmosphere, in 2009 around the Sydney, Australia area, people woke up to a scene straight out of a sci-fi film. This hazy orange atmosphere inspired the famous Las Vegas ruin scene in 2049. Sometime before 2049, it became uninhabitable due to a dirty bomb going off and dousing the city with harmful radiation. In the time between the 2022 blackout and 2049, the radiation levels in the city had lowered to a nominal level, but it remained deserted. During this time, ex-Blade writer Rick Deckard moved into Las Vegas to live in seclusion after working with Frasia and the Replicant Resistant Movement to hide the child he had with Rachel. At some point, he also acquired a dog. The Replicant Registration Database was a record database used to register all replicant data and information. It was also used by the Human Supremacy Movement that utilized it to locate and kill all replicants. A number of children were processed through the Miracle Orphanage, including Anna Stellite, Deckard and Rachel's child. The orphanage was ran by a Mr. Cotton, who before was a school teacher that lived in Greater Los Angeles. The children kept at the orphanage with scavenged metals, including nickels for off-world colonial ships in the giant junk heaps of San Diego. The VidFon was a video telecommunication device that was heavily used in Los Angeles. The technology was created by November 2019 and was available for in-home use as well as public booths and inside spinners. Staline Laboratories was a facility in the Los Angeles area where Dr. Staline, Deckard and Rachel's secret child, created replicant memories for the Wallace Corporation. At the lab, Staline was confined to a room blocked off completely by a transparent screen through which she could speak to clients. This was due to a compromised immune system, probably due to one or both of her parents being potentially replicants, a condition that also prevented her from immigrating off-world with her adoptive parents that got her from the Morocco orphanage. At some point between her parents' departure and 2049, Nyander Wallace contracted her to create memories for his replicants. Retire was a term used by bounty hunters and blade runners as an alternative to the term assassinate or kill in regards to replicants. To retire replicants is another form of saying to kill replicants. 
Following the blackout in 2022, some Blade Runners instead used the term exterminate. This was just another way to dehumanize replicants to make the act of killing them easier. Hello, my name is Gino, and I'll be continuing the third tier. The Blade Runner Discord server is a not so wholesome place, where people from all over the Blade Runner community come together. It is home to over 600 users. You can find everyone from avid fans of the original to lore experts, cosplayers, and everyone in between. There are some pretty fantastic people that helped in the making of this iceberg. You can find the link to the Discord in the video description below. Blade Runner. The 1997 video game and Ray McCoy. Blade Runner the video game is a Westwood Studios game based in the 1982 film of the same name. Released in 1997, the game was advertised as the first real-time adventure game. The story features Blade Runner Ray McCoy hunting replicants in Los Angeles, California in the year 2019. As of November 2019, Ray McCoy is still a rookie Blade Runner for the LAPD. However, during this time, he's still not a full-fledged Blade Runner. He lives with his dog Maggie in the apartment 88F. Ray McCoy's history is kind of a blur. Many think he's a replicant who had his memories wiped by his lieutenant Edison Guza as an experiment. In the game, Ray is obviously heavily based on Rick Deckard from the film, and is more of a bootleg copy of Deckard than the real character with lore implications. The Deckard replicant theory is as old as the original book itself. The most compelling evidence from the original film that Deckard is a replicant comes from the unicorn scene added in the director's cut, which we already discussed. When Gaff makes a unicorn origami for Deckard, it is a sign that Gaff knew about Deckard's dream, much in the way that Deckard knew about Rachel's memories. After Roy dies, Gaff tells Deckard, You've done a man's job, sir, which further provides evidence that Gaff knew Deckard was a replicant. At the very end of the film, when Deckard finds the origami, he smirks. Many people believe that he smirks because he finally has the answer to his question about his identity. In the first Blade Runner, Gaff would make a figure to coincide the character's status in that moment, or to taunt others around him. First he calls Deckard a chicken, with the chicken origami. He then leaves Leon, a stickman figure, in his apartment to let him know that they are onto him. He then points out Deckard's apparent implanted memories with the unicorn he leaves at his apartment. Roy is the main character. This entry refers to the fan theory or belief that the character Roy Batty, portrayed by Rutger Hauer, is in fact the main character of the story. Roy steals every scene he is in and has one of the most iconic deaths in film history. This theory claims that Roy's only sin is wanting more life and escaping his owners. His motives and aspirations are in fact not evil despite what the movie wants us to believe. Regardless of this, Roy and the rest of the renegade replicants get hunted down and killed. Just a fun theory that makes you view the film in a different light. The original Blade Runner book. The novel, The Blade Runner, is a 1974 science fiction novel by Alan E. Norse, centered around underground medical services and smuggling. It was the source for the name of the 1982 film Blade Runner. Despite sharing the same name, the novel has nothing to do with the Blade Runner franchise. Animoid Animoid was a term for synthetic organisms that were designed and created to mirror animals in both behavior and habitat. Following the Third Terran War, most animals had either died out or went completely extinct. In 2019, the market for animoids surged in popularity in the Los Angeles area, provided by designers such as Abdul Ben Hassan. Hassan specifically dealt with snakes, but animoids were also known to exist for owls, eagles, ostriches, dragonflies, and dogs. Additionally, animoids were powered by rechargeable batteries and were known to be very expensive. Sapper Morton Sapper Morton was a Nexus 8 replicant and combat medic who hid in the outskirts of Greater Los Angeles as a protein farmer. Morton settled on his farm in 2020, following his tenure as a combat medic in Calantha, 
where he fought alongside Freza Sadikpour. Prior to escaping a year later, where he assisted in the birth and hiding of Rachel and Deckard's daughter. Morton is also seen in Blade Runner 2048, Nowhere to Run. While defending a homeless mother and their daughter, he befriended, he drops his identification papers on the ground by accident, of which a man who had been spying on him picks him up. That same man then reports that he found a skin job. An investigation later reveals Sapper's location. Agent K is then sent to retire him. A job that he succeeds in doing at the start of the sequel film. Coca-Cola This refers to the many Coca-Cola ads that are seen in the first and second Blade Runner movies. Nothing deep about it, just something that fans have noticed. The Cybertruck November 2019 Incident Following the announcement of Tesla's Cybertruck in November 2019, many Blade Runner fans were quick to notice the uncanny resemblance between the Cybertruck and many vehicles that we see in the first Blade Runner movie. It also didn't help that the Cybertruck was announced to the world around the same date that the original movie is set in, and of course, the name itself. Coincidence? Or did Elon do that on purpose? Tell us what you think in the comments below. Six ten twenty one. The seemingly random assortment of numbers pertains to when Rachel gave birth, but this entry refers to the fact that fans still argue about whether this date refers to the 10th of June or the 6th of October. I guess we'll never know. Starting this tear off with a bit of a woozy, the Blade Runner 2049 4 hour cut is one of those things you wish was true but probably will never happen kind of situations. In some interviews, Denis Villeneuve talked about a 4 hour cut of the Blade Runner 2049 film that's circulating in some studio editing room somewhere. Dennis wasn't talking about an actual cut, rather the movie before editing was 4 hours. So technically, a 4 hour version of the film does exist. It's just a longer version that probably has some extra scenes that we'll most likely never see. Ryan Gosling plays a lot of loner slash antisocial characters throughout his many movies, including his Officer K character in Blade Runner. This has prompted many memes where people see Ryan Gosling's many characters to be just like them, or having similar personalities. Just another set of Blade Runner memes that surface around the internet. Blade Runner 9732 is a Deckard apartment simulator game that tries to capture the ambience of the first movie. It was a small game that is pretty darn accurate to the film. The game can also be played in VR for further immersion. When walking into the balcony, the Blade Runner Blues starts playing as a nod to the famous Deckard in the balcony scene from both the film and the 1997 video game. A spinner was a type of automobile used by the Los Angeles Police Department. It was utilized extensively by the police to survey the population and was capable of driving on the ground or flying in air. A little thing that people might not know is that these spinners in the films are based on real brands, from K's Peugeot to Love's Aston Martin. You remember how we talked about Deckard being a replicant and the unicorn scene? Well, this theory asks a simple question, how did Gaff know that Deckard got the unicorn vision? The only way Gaff would know is if he had something to do with Deckard's implanted memories. 
Maybe Gaff and Deckard have more in common than we are led to believe. Electric Sheep is a crowdsourced software that works as a live wallpaper daydream. It had been inspired by the Blade Runner book. Its point is to visualize the computer's dreams as it sleeps. The computer dreams of Electric Sheep. Kanye has showed his love for Blade Runner in a multitude of ways. Besides the apparent Blade Runner influence in Kanye's fashion line, he had a famous tweet where apparently Kanye plays Blade Runner on repeat on his giant screen. A really cool fan-made cut of the film that tries to not only restore all the deleted scenes, but it also tries to add scenes, all inspired by the original concept art by famous visual futurist and conceptual designer Sid Mead. A very cool project that has a release date of November 2022. You can follow the creator's channel for more updates. This entry refers to the many Blade Runner fan games. A lot of these games are very much underground and hard to find. It doesn't help that there isn't that many of them either. And most of them are not released and are just proof of concepts or demos that will never see the day of light. Blade Runner Revelations, on the other hand, is a real game that was released in 2018. It's a VR game developed by Seismic Games and published by Alcon Entertainment for the Google Daydream. The game takes place in the 2023 Los Angeles and follows Blade Runner Harper in an investigation into the human replicant conflict. A line of comic books that tells many side stories starting with the Blade Runner Origins that is set in 2009, 10 years before the events of the first film take place, and many other across the 2010s and 2020s. Whether Deckard is a rep or human, the point is that it shouldn't really matter at the end of the day. The theories and speculation are just a waste of time and miss the true point that being a human isn't about how you were born or made, but it is your actions that define your humanity. Some replicants are more human than human, some humans are more monsters than man. Both films were actually box office flops. It seems that both movies do really bad at the box office. A lot of the audience go in expecting some sci-fi film with a lot of action, but leave turned off with the movie's long playtime and convoluted storyline. They miss the deeper meaning and fail to appreciate the art. Both movies only gained appreciation and became cult classics after the release and after they had some time to sit. Since at least 2019, various movements were formed to promote the freedom of replicants. In 2019, the Replicant Underground, a network of former Tyrell Corporation designers, had formed. Sympathizing with replicants, the group assisted two replicants to El Centuro, a refugee camp situated on a beach in Baja that was inhabited by refugee replicants. Also that year, the Citizens Against Replicant Slavery held a rally for the cause. And by 2023, the Replicant Underground Resistance had formed. Nematodes were a species of artificial worm developed by Wallace Corporation. High in protein, they were a primary source of food by the year 2049. Farmers such as Sapper Morton would grow nematodes in plastic dome tents and use bioreactors as fertilizers. Leon Kowalski was a Nexus 6 replicant and friend of Roy Batty. His emotions were at a much lower level of development than Roy's. Leon was classified as a mental level C. 
he did not have the speed of thought Roy had when it came to getting through a situation, resorting instead to simple violence. After arriving on Earth, following his escape from an off-world colony, Leon lodged at a Yukon hotel and found employment as a waste disposal engineer at the Tyrell Corporation. By the early 21st century, Earth was suffering from devastating climate change and pollution, which necessitated the settlements of off-world colonies by the year 2018. Many who remain on planet Earth were encouraged to immigrate. Despite the pressure to leave Earth, many humans continued to live on the planet, well off into the 2040s and 50s. By this time, the ecosystem had collapsed and virtually all non-human life was extinct. Dr. Eldon Tyrell was the founder and corporate head of the Tyrell Corporation. He and his company were responsible for designing, manufacturing, and selling of humanoid slaves called replicants. In the year 1999, Tyrell created a video announcing the release of Nexus One the following year. As of 2019, 20 years after the announcement of the first Nexus Ones, the corporation was headquartered in two large pyramid-like structures on the outskirts of Los Angeles. Elevators ran across the outside of the massive pyramids. The company was doing well off into the 2020s, but after the blackout, the corporation went bankrupt and its assets were purchased by the Canaan Corporation. In 2028, the remains of the company were purchased by Nyander Wallace of the Wallace Corporation, who then resumed work on the replicants. By 2049, San Diego housed a massive amount of trash, making it home to scavengers and the Morocco Orphanage where orphans were put to work salvaging metals. These scavengers found refuge in the ruins of San Diego and operated from its ruined streets. The most prominent synthesizer used in the score of the original film was the Yamaha CS80, which can be prominently heard in the opening scenes. Today, the CS80 is seen as a rare collectible item that can be found on sale with prices ranging from the thousands to tens of thousands. Vangelis is notorious for completing scores extremely late, which is one of the reasons why he rarely gets film work, and he was running significantly behind schedules when it came to work on Blade Runner. The film producers had another composer signed as a retainer, basically, just in case Vangelis didn't finish in time. When Vangelis learned about this, he refused to release the soundtrack. The real Blade Runner soundtrack was not made available until more than a decade after the film was originally released. Because of this, all we had access to was an absolutely terrible interpretation of the music by an orchestra and a guy with a cheap keyboard. From 1982 to 1994, people didn't have access to the amazing Blade Runner soundtrack that we know and love today. This had led many to believe that Ridley and Vangelis secretly hate each other. Around the time Blade Runner 2049, Ridley and Dennis had a meeting with Vangelis to try to see if they can come up with a deal for him to make the Blade Runner 2049 score, of which Vangelis refused, further adding fuel to the fire of this theory. The New American Dictionary was a 2016 publication that defined replicants as a synthetic human with paraphysical capabilities, having skin and flesh culture. This refers to Decker's dog from 2049. There is much speculation whether the dog was real or an animal, or about what had happened to him after Decker's kidnapping by love. A darker theory that circulates around is that the replicant rebels that saved K probably ate the dog. This was supported by the fact that the last we see of the dog is when the rebels find K and then we cut straight to them at a campfire in the middle of nowhere. A potential insinuation that the rebels are eating the dog. Of course, this would only be true if the dog is real, of which is a very small chance of being. 
When developing the 1997 video game, Westwood Company had some trouble when it came to scoring the game. While they had permission from Alcon to use the music composed by Vangelis, they didn't have access to the original master's recordings, which meant that the game's music composer, Frank Klapaski, had to reconstruct the film's music by ear, of which he did such a great job at doing that the game devs praised him so much for and claimed that the version of the soundtrack he made is clearer than the original. The 2022 blackout, something that we have mentioned multiple times previously, is a very major event in Blade Runner history. The blackout was an unprecedented electricity blackout that affected Los Angeles for 10 days in May 2022. Due to the human supremacy movement gaining steam after news of the new Nexus 8s with natural lifespans, it sparked an outrage in the streets of Los Angeles. Members of the movement used the replicant registration database to identify, hunt down, and kill all replicants. This led to a group of replicants and replicant advocates to come up with a plan to destroy the servers hosting the Tyrell Corporation's database of registered replicants. The plan consisted of Trizzy, Iggy, and Ren detonating a nuclear warhead at the stratosphere over LA in order to overload the city's electrical grid with a powerful EMP blast and erase any trace of electronic data. Ren and Iggy would then, at the same time, explode a hijacked fuel truck inside the server farm, thus ensuring no replicant information could ever be retrieved. The plan was a success and all replicant production was banned shortly thereafter. Similar to Cyberpunk 2077, in Fallout 4, there's an easter egg that pays homage to the tears and rain scene, hiding in a wasteland. Above a building, you can find a recreation of the scene. As we said before, Dr. Anna Celine was a subcontractor under the Wallace Corporation, working as a memory designer at an upgrade center named Staline Laboratories. She is secretly Deckard and Rachel's child. Prior to the birth, in order to protect his daughter and partner, Deckard left them in the care of Replicant Freedom Group, especially Sepper Morton and Frasia. Following up on the Look Lonely meme entry from before, the Blade Runner 2049 Doomer influence is pretty huge. The Doomer meme community seems to have a lot of love for this film. Kay is seen by many to lead a very relatable life. He is a lonely, lost person trying to find meaning in a rather meaningless significance. In a hostile, impressive environment that can eat you up alive if threaded not carefully. Blade Runner 2049 hits every criteria for the Doomer persona. Therefore, Blade Runner 2049 is a Doomer film. This entry simply refers to the fact that Blade Runner has had much bigger influence than people realize. Pretty much any recent sci-fi or cyberpunk media, whether it's film, comics, or video games, has either been softly or significantly inspired by Blade Runner. As the original film was a pioneer for cyberpunk and sci-fi art style brought to live action cinema. The Alien and Blade Runner franchise had secretly shared the same universe for years, with more connections made with each installment. The theory that Ridley Scott's Alien and Blade Runner are connected has evolved from folklore to fact. To name a few of the evidence, one of the first signs of that being the technology between the first two movies is shared, with many user interfaces that you might see on the Nostromo being identical to ones you would see on a Blade Runner spinner. Another one being, in the Aliens movie, Captain Dallas's file has the Tyrell Corporation as one of his previous employment positions. While it was never officially said, it's pretty obvious when you look deeper into it that these two universes are shared. To 
Total Recall is a sci-fi film that is loosely based on Philip K. Dick's short story We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. The film follows a bored construction worker who dreams of visiting Mars. Total Recall is set in the PKD universe. The PKD universe is a collection of his works and their adaptations from the 1950s and 60s, including The Minority Report, The We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, and Do Androids Dream Of Electric Sheep. Due to this, Blade Runner and Total Recall share the same universe. The Wallace Corporation Earth Headquarters is surely a structure impressive in its design, only comparable to the previously grand Tyrell Corporation Pyramids. A small detail in this structure is that when viewed from the front, the structure is in the same shape as the corporation's famous logo. Sid Mead was the original concept designer of the first Blade Runner. By the end of early production, Sid Mead had finished a multitude of conceptual designs for the film, everything from LA's neon dressed city streets to the technology and the backdrops are seen in the film of the future City of Angels. We can thank Sid Mead for creating the sci-fi cyberpunk look that we all grew to love. During Officer K's investigation on the replicant child, he had stumbled across Rick Decker's recording of his avoid comp test that he had performed on Rachel. Following this info, K contacted retired Blade Runner and Decker's partner across the first film, Gaff. It is during this talk that Gaff, who is famous for his origami, finishes a sheep origami figure, an homage to Dick's do androids dream of electric sheep. By the year 2019, humanity had colonized and terraformed many alien worlds. Humans turned these planets into new homes and set on immigrating there. We heard a lot about them, and although we know some of their names, we never actually see them in the films. Nor do we know how many exist. By mid-2049, we know that 9 additional off-world colonies exist, and that most of the Earth's population had immigrated off-world. Following a major tsunami by the year 2025, construction of the Sepulveda seawall around Los Angeles' coastline was commissioned, with some replicants being illegally employed for the project. The seawall's coastline helped in stopping further tsunamis and the rising sea level due to Earth's deteriorating state and climate. Blade Runner screenwriter David Peebles said that his other film, Soldier is a spin-off sequel to Blade Runner, proving a theory that many had held for years. The official Blade Runner RPG is an upcoming tabletop roleplay game set in 2037. It will propel players into the streets of Los Angeles as Blade Runners. Another easter egg of the tears and rain scene in another video game, this time it's Observer. Developers just seem to love this scene, huh? Many see Roy's dove as his soul. When Roy dies, his dove is released to fly up in the air with the final shot of the dove flying away. Batty releases the dove rather than killing it because he understood the importance of life, the value of saving and preserving life rather than ending it. This is mirrored in his actions of saving Deckard. The Blade Runner landscape has always been polluted and overcast. In the first film, we see Los Angeles with almost non-stop rain, and when the sun was shown, it was a gloomy, fog-ridden atmosphere that hid it away with an orange overlay. By 2049, the state of Los Angeles and the planet had worsened. Now instead of rain, heavy snow and smog covers the city, with an even worsened distinct lack of natural sunlight. In the Wallace Corporation's 300-story building interior, Wallace had built the interiors with strange geometric shapes to create dramatic shadows cast by the yellow light. There is no natural sunlight in the building or the world, so Wallace had created his own.
City Speak was a street language of the citizens of Los Angeles. It was a combination of Japanese, Spanish, German, and other languages. This was due to Los Angeles' much mixed population that had immigrated from all over the world. This mismatch of languages became the preferred talk of the average city dweller. Gaff was known of speaking in City Speak. Ray had an ex-wife. We only hear of this in the narrated scenes from the film and only see her in one photo. Could this be his real wife or an implanted memory similar to Rachel's? Animoid Row was an area in LA that housed various vendors. There you can find damn near anything, but specifically a lot of Animoid vendors. Calantha was an off-world colony that was seized by forces assisted by the Tyrell Corporation. We know at least that Sepper Morton, Frasia, and Iggy had served there. Mars was the first off-world colony. It was a planet occupied by humans as part of the United Nations sanctioned colonization program. It contained several settlements, including New America. The Ten Houser's Gate was a location of a campaign in which Roy Batty participated in, having flown gypsy ships with the Russians. In a deleted scenes from the 1998 film Soldier, it was a warp station. Ten Houser's Gate was shown on screen in one of the film's deleted scenes, and it is mentioned in the film and taught service history as being a battle he participated in. The only thing that we do know about Jupiter is that it was another off-world colony. But the Argentine moons were an off-world colony based on a series of moons with plutonium furnaces of 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Roy Batty was sent here during his off-world campaigns. Going back to the Alien Blade Runner shared universe, during the 2012 Prometheus film, in Peter Whalen's diaries, there is a chapter where he recalls his mentor, Eldon Tyrell. The chapter reads, A mentor and long departed competitor once told me that it was time to put away childish things and abandon my toys. He encouraged me to come work for him and together we would take over the world and become the new gods. That's how he ran his corporation, like a god on top of a pyramid overlooking a city of angels. Of course, he chose to replicate the power of creation in an unoriginal way by simply copying God. And look how that turned out for the poor bastard. Literally blew up in the old man's face. I always suggested he stick with simple robotics instead of those genetic abomination he enslaved and sold off world. Although his idea to implant them with false memories was, well, amusing is how I would put it politely. Fortunately, I chose a different trajectory, employing innovation and ingenuity when launching the Wayland Robotics Division. Even our earliest synthetics display tremendous intelligence, intuition, and compatibility despite their admittedly unconvincing exterior. Night Owl was a viral pathogen developed by Alden Tyrell to eliminate replicants if they were ever deemed too dangerous to society. The toxin was fast acting, killing an infected replicant within an hour of exposure. When tested on a real one, death occurred in only 6 minutes. World War Terminus, or the Third Terran War, was a conflict that occurred some years prior to 2021 and resulted in the devastation of much of the planet Earth. In the aftermath, a radioactive dust was left in the atmosphere, necessitating extraterrestrial colonization. The cause of the war and its victors, if any, was unknown. Humans and replicant combatants were involved. The Shimago Dominguez Corporation was a corporation that paid for the famous advertisement of the off-world colonies that goes like this. A new life awaits you in the off-world colonies. The chance to begin again in a golden land of opportunity and adventure. 
During the 1982 to 1994 No Soundtrack incident, there was a lot of bootleg Blade Runner soundtracks that were surfacing around. I hear that a lot of these were pretty terrible, but sadly, from my research, it seems like all have been lost to time. Maybe one day, one of these bootlegs will surface up. Freja is the leader of the Replicant Rebels, who is known for having a missing eye. Many theorize that Freja had removed her own eye to remove traces of her Replicant origins. The eye is one of the first areas looked at for a serial number in Replicants. This is just an ad that Ridley Scott shot around the same time Blade Runner was being filmed. A lot of people say they see similarities between the two. I personally don't. What do you think? This simply refers to the scene where Officer K out of nowhere just busts through a concrete wall making him look like the Kool-Aid Man ads. It's just a funny reference. Following the blackout and the bankruptcy of Tyrell, Canan Corporation was a company that acquired the assets of the Tyrell Corporation. This was before Wallace's advancements on buying the Tyrell company. The barcode on Love's Spinner license plate reads Philip K. Dick when scanned. Arnolfo de Cambio whiskey glasses are the glasses that Deckard was drinking out of in the famous balcony scene in the first film. These glasses make a return during his scene with Wallace when Deckard's past is brought up to face him. The colonization program was organized by the United Nations shortly after World War Terminus. Aimed at populating regions outside of Earth, the war brought a new phase of the program, particularly with the introduction of replicants, one of which was given to each person who immigrated. The radioactive dust that remained in the atmosphere made colonization a necessity for many. Among these settled lands was planet Mars. Due to exposure to radioactive dust that hung in the Earth's atmosphere following World War Terminus, many people had come to suffer and took much brain damage. These people were referred to as specials, sometimes as chicken heads or ant heads depending on one's intellectual capacity. Specials are individuals who fail to pass an IQ test, thus forbidding them from emigrating from Earth, reproducing, or marrying. Since we have proven that Alien and Blade Runner share the same universe, this means that the events of Alien are just upcoming events in Blade Runner. In this case, then by 2192, the Earth will be completely destroyed, and our beloved Los Angeles will probably be in complete ruin. This was due to a xenomorph apocalypse that occurred after a failed transportation of the species. Earth was completely run over by these creatures, and a few that could escape to space or to off-world colonies did. The rest all died. The deaths were in the billions. As a last ditch effort, humans used the Queen Alien to summon every earthbound xenomorph to her location and then nuke the place. After this, a new age of the planet had began, and the reconstruction and repopulation of the planet was set to full speed. If you look up Indian Blade Runner, you will get something completely unexpected. Nothing bad or anything, actually pretty wholesome. I'll let you look it up by yourself and save you the surprise. Due to overpopulation by 2019, birth control and birth control ads were something normal to see blasted on sides of buildings. The famous geisha that we see is actually an advertisement for birth control pills. The Sonic 1 Scrap Brain Zone level is a level that is inspired by Blade Runner. The background is inspired by Los Angeles, and the ending music is inspired by the credit music.
In season 5 episode 10, while following young Rick, there's a small scene inspired by the introduction noodle scene from the original film, and just a small easter egg from the Rick and Morty creators. Following the Cybertruck incident, Elon tweeted this owl with the tag, it's artificial, an obvious nod to the film. There is a theory out there that claims that Rachel might not have been an experimental Nexus 7, but instead she was experimental because she was human, a human that had been brainwashed and implanted with fake memories. This was Tyrell's final trick. He had tried to replicate mankind to enslave them. Perhaps the answer was right in front of him the entire time. This would explain Rachel's long lifespan, something that was later introduced with Nexus 8. Why the Void Comtesse had so much trouble picking out she was a replicant. It would also definitely explain why she was the only replicant who could reproduce. Wallace had spent years trying to create a reproducing replicant, decades after Tyrell, and still failed. Is this because Tyrell knew some sort of secret that nobody else does? Or is it perhaps the simplest explanation that maybe Rachel was a human? Now there's obviously things that debunk this theory, mainly being Rachel's bones having a set of serial numbers, but it is always a possibility. You know how the rebels were ready to do pretty much anything to protect the child? That began even killing Deckard? Well, it wouldn't be so crazy to say that maybe they would lie about the child's gender. Maybe Kay was the child the entire time. Something to think about. Memories of Green was a Vangelis song that Ridley Scott had liked so much, he asked Vangelis to add it to the Blade Runner score, even though it was released way before the film. In the song No Expectation Boulevard, around 3 minutes and 41 seconds, you'll hear Ridley Scott talking. The song was by Vangelis from 2007, made for the 25th anniversary of Blade Runner. Scott is saying in a transmission, a message from outer space, this is from Ridley, I'm 25 years away, and here we are, talking about the same subject that was reborn in October or November this year. I'm afraid we don't see each other more often. Maybe our spaceships will finally come together in the near future. Hopefully, that could happen. This is Ridley signing off, and I hope you'll eventually will pick me up. In a deleted scene during the Deckard vs. Roy fight, there is a scene of a woman in a bathtub. Kinda weird that she doesn't really react to the fight, but this does exist somewhere. There was a famous San Diego sneak peek preview cut that was shown before the film was released. In this cut, there was a bunch of lost media, being a introduction of Roy Batty in a Vidfan booth, Deckard reloading his gun after Batty breaks his fingers, and a shot of Deckard and Rachel riding off into the sunset. You know how there's Joy? Well apparently there's also a male version named Boy. That's it. Boy exists in the Blade Runner universe. Do with that information as you wish. The Wallace is a failsafe created by Tyrell Theory is a theory that claims that Tyrell might have created Wallace as a failsafe replicant to replace him after his death and to continue his legacy on building replicants. Fake replicant or human slave theory is a belief that many hold that in the Blade Runner universe there are real human slaves or being sold off as replicants through human trafficking rings. A dark theory that knowing the Blade Runner world probably is true. The famous 2023 TED Talk speech that was given by Peter Whelan where he talks about humanity's history with technology, of our existence as the new gods, of our journey of terraforming new worlds and creating synthetic life. Well, we know that Peter Whelan saw Eldon Tyrell as his mentor and predecessor, that he inspired him to be great. But by 2023, Eldon was long dead, and Peter Whelan was seen as the new man to look up to. It is possible that Neander Wallace Jr. saw and was inspired by this famous speech. 
It is even possible that he attended it, being that the TED Talk was in Long Beach, California, and by a man who many see as an equal to Tyrell. Shortly after the speech, only two years later in fact, Wallace Jr. made his first move onto the world by saving it from its crisis state and putting his mark on it forever. By 2026, the abandoned Tyrell headquarters was occupied by squatters and a scientist named Foss. Foss was a Tyrell Corporation scientist who remained at the headquarters and as of 2026, still believed the corporation was operational. Foss had a lab where he housed decomposing replicants, still believing they were alive. Following Cannon's inquiring of Tyrell's assets and despite the 2023 prohibition on replicant production, by 2027, the Cannon Corporation hired a number of ex-Tyrell engineers in order to illegally produce highly obedient Nexus 8s. These replicants were illegally sold off to other corporations or to whoever wanted them in the underground markets. According to actress Sylvia Hoax, the actress who played Love, in an early version of the script, she is killed by being stabbed in the head with a joy emanator. A gruesome death indeed. I guess Joy got her revenge after all. The Mayan Revival architecture is a style of architecture that is seen in both Decker's apartment and Kay's kitchen. The Las Vegas scene had taken some influence from some concept art from the city from the film Artificial Intelligence. A self-explanatory theory that claims that Elton Tyrell was either a clone or had a replicant clone of himself. Maybe Wallace was one of those clones. There is a deleted scene of Joy dressed as Marilyn Monroe. The only thing left of this is a simple photo. It is believed that being in a Blade Runner film as a brand brings a curse onto you. This was started through the many brands being featured in the first film either had a big falling down, were bought out, or went bankrupt. Two deleted scenes where Deckard visits fellow Blade Runner Holden after he was shot by Leon. Holden is barely holding on to his life at the hospital. This is the only scene where Deckard and Holden are seen interacting and by the look of it, seem to be pretty good friends. An alternative ending of Blade Runner where Deckard and Rachel ride off into the sunset far away from the gloomy Los Angeles. This ending was seen as too happy and bright for the film and so it was cut. And for good reason, it definitely looks out of place. This is a less known alternative scene that further proves the theory that Deckard might not be a replicant and that Gaff knows something more that we don't. In this scene, Gaff tells Deckard. It's done a man's job, sir. Are you sure you are a man? It's hard to tell who's who around here. Pavlov Institute was a Soviet group that developed a Volkov test to detect replicants. And speaking of Soviets, the Soviet Union exists and is still operational in 2019 and the 2049 films. We know pretty much nothing about it, but we do know that they are alive and well and that they are a world superpower.
Some say dark and mysterious things happen in this place. The Blade Runner roleplay server is a place that exists. All I know about it is that people there roleplay. I don't know how they do it or what it looks like, but it seems to be a private club that very few get access of. Maybe we'll never know. Apparently this is true. Alcon only has two employees in charge of canon and continuity for the Blade Runner franchise. How about that for a sad truth? This entry refers to a previous version of the script where the entire Deckard and Roy fight scene happens while Roy is in a jockstrap. Imagine if this made it to the final script. Blade Runner will be a very different movie. Some crazy lad from the Discord server was trying to create an ultimate cut of the film that had every single piece of cut content, fixed color grading, and a whole lot more. He sadly went quiet. We might never see that ultimate cut. The sad and scary fact that Ruder Howard, the actor who played Roy, died the same year in real life as his Roy Batty character did in the film. Was it a coincidence, or did Ruder Hauer and Roy Batty have a deeper connection than we know? This entry refers to this little scene from the film. The only thing that we could find is that this refers to two very small Argentinian bands that existed in the 80s. Some of their music still exists on YouTube. Palefire is more than just a book that shows up in a joy scene. It is actually what inspired the entire baseline test scene. In this book, there is a poem that goes exactly like this. And bloodbath nothingness began to spin. A system of cells interlinked within cells, interlinked within cells, interlinked within one stem. And dreadfully distinct, against the dark, a tall white fountain played. Italian futurist architect Antonio Santelia, whose work inspired the visual world of Blade Runner. Antonio Santelia is the man who published the Manifesto of Futurist Architecture in 1914. He is quoted of saying, everything must be revolutionized, roof and underground spaces must be used, the importance of the facade must be diminished, issues of taste must be transplanted from the field of fussy moldings, finicky capitals and flimsy doorways to the broader concerns of bold groupings and masses, and large-scale disposition of planes. Let us make an end of monumental funereal and commemorative architecture. Let us overturn monuments, pavements, arcades and flights of steps. Let us sink the streets and squares. Let us raise the level of the city. His most obvious influence piece being the Tyrell Pyramid. The Long Tomorrow is a comic that was given to Sid Mead by Ridley as something to inspire him for his concept art for the film. It's obvious when looking at it that Sid Mead designs were highly influenced by this work of art. This refers to the rapidly advancing technology of holographic displays and artificial intelligence. And most likely less than a decade will have the ability to replicate joy products. We can maybe even do it sooner using augmented reality technology, bringing virtual beings into the real world. Real life joys and boys are way closer than we think. Another alien universe theory, when Blade Runner 2049's trailer dropped, many looked at the replicants from the scene and felt that they looked a little bit too close to the engineers seen in Prometheus, their skin color and their size. Why is Wallace growing giant pale replicants? Perhaps Wallace had knowledge of these beings, perhaps he was trying to recreate them on Earth. The Wallace Corporation ringtone that we hear throughout the film is actually from a symphony named Peter and the Wolf composed by Soviet composer Sergei Prokofiev. Some say that Wallace chose this particular sound due to the moral of the story from Peter and the Wolf. 
You can't be a hero if you don't take risks. This entry refers to Senator Bannister, who was a Los Angeles politician in the year 2032. Bannister was known to hunt replicants for sports. During the conceptual design phase, Sid Mead had sketches drawn of an apparent Elden Tyrell tomb that housed his sarcophagus that was buried deep under the Tyrell Corporation pyramids. Not much info on this, the only proof is the art itself that Sid had created. The November 2019 Timeline Separation Incident is believed by many to be a separation of timelines that happened in 2019 where our timeline was separated from the Blade Runner timeline since the events of the film are said in November 2019. This means that somewhere in the multiverse, Blade Runner is real. This theory claims that Roy is lying about seeing things. Not that he's intentionally lying, but he's lying because the things that he's recalling to Deckard as seen on his off-world adventure, the Ten Houser Gate, the sea beams in the sky, are all lies because he never actually saw them. They were all implanted memories. Roy never even left Earth. Roy was born on Earth. He was given those memories for one reason or another. Maybe he was implanted. Maybe whoever created him wanted him to go with his plan. Maybe Roy wasn't the rebel replicant that killed Ellen Tyrell. Maybe Roy was implanted to do those things. Joy Not Real Theory is basically claiming that Joy throughout the film is just a basic AI program to give her user whatever they want. That's literally the product tagline. All you want to see, all you want to hear. All the emotion she showed was pre-programmed giving the illusion of sentience. This is pretty grim. It's easy for us to be fooled cause she is played by a real actress and Joy acts in all the ways a real person would. But we know she's not. She is just software. She isn't aware. She doesn't have emotions. She is just an advanced version of Siri or Google Home, which makes Kay's story even more depressing. The last that we see of Rachel and the child was with Sabra Moore. During the Rachel bone inspection, the LAPD forensics technician comments that Sabra maybe ate the baby. We know that the child survives, but perhaps he ate someone else. Perhaps he ate Rachel. If he did, for whatever reason, we would never know. But all I'm gonna say is that maybe the comment that was given by the LAPD forensics technician might be insinuating something we don't know. Tulpas are personally to me a pretty creepy concept. Tulpas originate in theosophy and mysticism, and the paranormal of an object and being that is created through spiritual or mental powers. They are an advanced form of an imaginary friend, but they have their own thoughts, feelings, and ideas independent from your own. Tulpas can appear spontaneously and sometimes they take weeks, months, or years to come to life. Reasons for wanting to have a tulpa are perhaps unsurprisingly loneliness and social awkwardness. Some say it is a self-given schizophrenia. Apparently, around 2017, after the release of Blade Runner 2049, an individual was documenting his process into trying to manifest a Joy or Officer K Topa on 4chan. He wanted them to be there in the back of his mind. Not much is known about this individual or of what had happened to him, but somewhere out there in the world, there is a Joy and Officer K Topas doing God knows what.
We have had the technology to create clones for a while now. During the first years of animal clone research and after the first animal cloning being a success, many world governments quickly set to put new laws in place that abolished the cloning or research of human embryo therapeutic cloning. This was an obvious reaction to a new technology that might bring forward new questions about morality. Of course, not all countries agreed and not all abolished it. When thinking about the countless amount of medical criminal rings of organ trafficking or human slave trade in much of the underground red markets, the truth is, just out of probability alone, somewhere in the world, in some underground facility, real human clones are being created. Whatever the reason is, I'm sure is a dark one, but they do exist, real replicants in our real world. And that will be the closing entry for this iceberg. And what a journey has it been. This iceberg was created in a matter of weeks, literally. I started working on it two weeks ago and spent the last week creating this video. I haven't had a good night's sleep and God knows what. And I have said and typed the words Blade Runner more times than I could ever know. So please, if you made it this far, show this video some love, share this around. This is my first time creating an iceberg, let alone creating a video over an hour long. But I still can't believe I pulled it off in a week. This iceberg is also posted on icebergcharts.com and is still a work in progress. So if you have any additional entries that you think need to be on this or any corrections, you can leave them in the comments down below. And who knows, if there's enough new entries, I might do a follow-up update. And with that being said, please like and subscribe, and I will see you all very soon.